No surprises for where I ask you to turn in your Bibles to, isn't it? Uh, we can't leave James where we have been. We've got to finish it. And it's been uh, just such a refreshing book to, to get into. And it's been so uh, fraught with meaning and uh, wonderful profundities to chew on and think about. But uh, my, my hope and prayer is that by the end of this series as we leave James aside that you would know the book of James thoroughly that you would be able to just know first chapter second chapter third chapter fourth and fifth chapter and know all the themes that are in it and that's why the the amount of time that we spend just on repeating things because it's, it's such a beautiful letter that he has written and uh, many many wonderful themes in the midst of it isn't it uh, right from the beginning that one line that he says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials and it makes you sit up and say, wait a minute, this is not just an ordinary book. He's saying something that is very, very startling. And that sets the tenor and the tone for the rest of the book completely in that one statement as we look at it. And then he talks about the rich and the poor and how in the world there's disparity between that and how the rich are more favored than the poor but in the kingdom of God they both come on an even plane then he talks about trials and temptations and says temptation never comes from God it uh, it always comes from the flesh the world or or the evil one and then talks about anger in the midst of righteousness he says the two don't mix anger cannot in any way be part of righteous living action in the midst of apathy that we have to be doers of the word not just hearers not to take it in one way and then let it out or the other or to look at ourselves in a mirror and then walk away forgetting what we looked at and then he says that we need to have always remember the widows and the orphans and to have compassion as we treat them and and look at them and then of course impartiality no favoritism in in the church and among the saints and then last week we looked at faith without works and said that without faith without works is dead good deeds must be found in the context of genuine faith so this week i'd like for us to move on and we uh, end this third chapter of james looking at verses 13 and then going down to verse 18 and i'd like to read from the new living translation verse 13 says if you are wise and understand god's ways prove it by living an honorable life doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying for jealousy and selfishness are not god's kind of wisdom such things are earthly unspiritual and demonic for whether for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition there you will find disorder and evil of every kind but the wisdom from above is first of all pure it is also peace loving gentle at all times and willing to yield to others it is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds it shows no favoritism and is always sincere and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness actually when we look at this these uh, five verses from 13 to 18 or six verses James is actually taking us back to the first chapter where he outlined for us three important aspects of religiosity. In chapter 1 verse 26, uh, 27 and 28, he says, <clears throat> you need to have three marks of genuine religion. The first, a controlled tongue. And we looked at that in chapter 3 verses 1 to 12. Then he says, you need to have a caring ministry to those in need and we looked at that in chapter 2 and then he also said you need to have a personal holiness untainted by the world and now he begins to look at that third aspect of genuine faith or genuine religion now when we look at this particular passage of scripture 
and we say, what is it like to be able to have a personal holiness maintained by the world, we are really looking back at the kind of behavior that he has been noticing in the church. Because if we pay attention to the various aspects that he has looked at, we find that he has looked at partiality, okay, which is demonstrated in behavior, favoritism, which again is noticed in behavior, an unruly tongue, losing sight of God in trials, unbridled anger, apathy, and paying only uh, with uh, uh, lip sense, just using your just words which really have no meaning or not backed up by any actions. And all of these are behavioral traits, all of these. And yet, what we find is that he, as he's been talking about behavior, that behavior is key, your faith must result in behavior, it seems to him that at some point he needs to stop talking and point us to what is right behavior as well. Because what he has shown us till now is not the behavior of the saints. That's what he has focused on till now. And so it's almost like he draws this to a point and says, now as we look at behavior, you're going to be able to say, but I have this kind of behavior already in me. And then he is able to discount it by saying, no, if you look at the behavior that, you've, that I've had to deal with, it is not the behavior of the kingdom. And so he says, the behavior that you need to have is a behavior that comes through wise decision making. The behavior that you will find in your lives must come through wise decision making. And then he says, now there are two kinds of of wisdoms that are at play and that's the thrust of this this particular passage that he says that there's a wisdom that is earthly and there's a wisdom that is heavenly the earthly wisdom he says is natural and demonic natural and demonic and produces jealousy selfish ambition disorder and evil things arrogance and lies about the truth. This is the kind of wisdom, if we rely on earthly wisdom, then this is the fruit that we will see. But if we rely on heavenly wisdom, then heavenly wisdom is pure and produces peaceableness, gentleness, is reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. So very clearly he's telling us the kind of behavior patterns that we can see from whether or not we are following after earthly wisdom or heavenly wisdom. Now, we reach a point like this and we think to ourselves, having been accosted with James and uh, all his arrows that he has kind of thrown in our hearts, and we say, well, I do have within me behavior that is consistent with my belief. And we are at a point where we slowly begin to justify and say, you know, I, I read the Bible, I'm praying, I'm doing those kind of things because everything that he's come up against us with has made us almost crawl back into a place to try and defend ourselves. That we, we are Christians, we do have a faith that is visible. And suddenly James is saying, wait a minute. If now you are saying that your behavior is consistent, then let's check the fruit. There is always fruit from behavior. Let's check the fruit and see what kind of wisdom you are using for making decisions in your life. So, look at the fruit, jealousy. Let's stop there and ask, are we jealous? Are we jealous of people around us? Are we jealous of colleagues? Are we jealous of other people's looks or clothes or uh, jobs or anything like that? Do we look at others and say, I envy you? Is there jealousy? And if there is even a hint of jealousy, he's saying the decision-making process that you have is wrong. That you have made that decision because jealousy is the fruit of it, that decision has been wrong. You have, you have acted in an earthly manner and you need to move it to a heavenly wisdom that will help you to act and have different kind of fruit. Selfish ambition. I must advance and nobody else. 
Do we have that? Sometimes you can't but have it in your office spaces, isn't it? Where everybody is kind of pushing, trying to get ahead. To have a selfish ambition that doesn't care about anybody else. And James is saying that, that is not kingdom living. That's not a wise way of making, of behavior, of making decisions that result in behavior. Or disorder. Do you have disorder in your lives? Has the harmony gone? Are the issues of unity? And he says again, stop and ask the question, what, what was my process in decision making? And as I was working with this, this passage of scripture, I thought to myself, it's so easy for us to disregard it. And in a way say, you know, James, you're, you're talking of all, all these kind of things. And okay, I don't have hypocrisy. I don't have, uh, I don't show favoritism. I, I mind my, the way I talk and all of those things. And then James takes it one step further and he says, but wait a minute. Let's look at the real source of your decision making. And if you are confused about the source, then look at the fruit. Look at the fruit and say, what have I left behind? What do I see in my wake? What do I see all around me? Is there disorder all around me? And then ask the question if there is, and I'm contributing towards it, then has the wisdom that I used from God or from myself or the world around me? And he says, the wisdom that we use will determine our behavior and behavior will determine what is good works that we have. So, a heavenly wisdom produces peace, gentleness, reasonable, humility, meekness, full of mercy and, and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And sometimes it's, we find it so difficult, isn't it, in our own lives to, to be able to say, I am going to be meek about this. I was talking about this after the first service and a couple came up to me and they were saying they were thankful for what I had said about meekness and what I had said was that meekness is strength under restraint strength under restraint it's not that you're weak it's that you have the strength to respond in like manner but you don't do it because it's not the godly response that is meekness so it's not, it has nothing to do with your weakness and so it has to do with being assertive creating boundaries around you, which is something that every Christian ought to do. Sometimes we think that we don't need to create boundaries, that we need to be uh, just uh, mats for people to walk on in our workplaces. No, that's not what you're called to be. You're called to assert yourself as well without being arrogant about it. You need to be able to also know that this is your space and these are the things that you can and will do and not be walked upon. That's what meekness is. That we're able to. I was just saying, you know, you have somebody push you. And uh, it's easy for you to push back and knock that person over. It's another thing entirely to just hold your hand there, not budge an inch and say, don't do it. That's meekness. When another person pushes, to be able to push back is not meekness. To be able to hold that person where he or she is and say, and that can happen in any area of your life. And it must happen. Just being a Christian doesn't mean that you're a pushover or a walkover for everybody to uh, take advantage of you. So we use a kind of wisdom that comes from God. And when he gives us that wisdom, then it is through that wisdom that we are able to have good behavior. He says there's a kind of peace that comes to us. And peace in this uh, instance is irene, which is the Greek word. And it has to do with harmony with God and with humanity. Harmony with God and with humanity. I thought that's a, such a good litmus test for us, isn't it? To look at our relationships, to look at the areas of influence that we have and say, do we have a sense of peace that pervades the, the whole area that we are in? Because if there is, then we are living that kind of, li of a life that is good and wholesome. And ethical. If you remember when we looked at uh, Matthew 
the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. It's not the people who maintain peace, but the peacemakers, the ones who make peace that are important. Sometimes we think that just holding back and not saying anything is keeping the peace. And oftentimes we get into more trouble than anything by doing that. Again, it interferes with the boundaries that we ought to set. But peacemakers, those who actively go out and make peace. And that's what we are called to be as well. That in our demeanor, in our actions, in our behavior, there's a sense of peace that envelops everything that we do. That's the kind of wisdom that we need to bring into our workplaces. And so I ask you to just think about it for a minute. Where you are, whether it is school or college or university or your office space or at home or on a commute, wherever you are, is there an aura of peace that surrounds you? Can people say that about you, that there's just such peace? That envelops you and if they do then it's a good indicator to you and to me that you know that we are leaning on heavenly wisdom and not our our own so as we look at these two wisdoms one that produces sin in 15 and 16 and one that produces righteousness in 17 and 18 we must ask the question what does being wise and making wise decisions entail. I want to give you four things that we need to look out for. The first, it must be accompanied by meekness. Must be accompanied by meekness. Secondly, it must be showcased by our behavior. Our behavior must be consistent with wise choices. Third, it must rely on a heavenly source. It must come out of conversations that we have had either with God's word or with God himself through his Holy Spirit. And fourth, it must exhibit good fruit. It must exhibit good fruit. You need to be able to look at your lives and say, I see the fruit of the Spirit all around me. Galatians chapter 5 has two lists. One is a, the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit and it would be good for you to just go home and look at those two lists and you know you get past the murderers and the adulterers and then you find small small things that may be things that we get engaged in being jealous causing strife all those kinds of things and ask the question okay in this particular area where strife has been caused how did i make the decision and then ask the Lord and say, Lord, now show me how do I move away from that, align with your will, and then make the right decision so that there is peace rather than strife in my life. And so take these four application points and put it to uh, work in your life through the day. I really would encourage you to look at Galatians chapter 5, read it, read it through, and ask yourselves, what, do, what can I learn about behavior uh, from Paul, and then apply it to what James is saying in, uh, in his epistle. But I want to end with this uh, note from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. If you have your Bibles, just look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Moses says, See, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes. So keep them and do them. Okay? For that is your wisdom. When you keep and do them, you are acting wisely and in the sight of of the people who are all around you. So it gives to us an, uh, the ability to showcase to people all around us something. What is that something? That they will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And I thought that's what they need to say about us, about you and me. Surely this person is a wise and understanding person because he or she acts in consistency with the statutes of the Almighty God. My prayer is that that would be your, your prayer as well, 
that you too will walk away from here saying that's what people need to say of me that I'm wise and an understanding person because they see the wisdom that is coming from heaven above amen let's pray together <clears throat> Heavenly Father, even as we have looked at your word, we have seen how easy it might have been for us to cross over from heavenly wisdom to earthly wisdom. Lord, uh, how easy it has been for us to accept uh, jealousy and selfish ambition and arrogance and all these and allow them to coexist with us, Master, who are bearers of your name. And we ask for forgiveness for that this morning. But Lord, stir our hearts enable us to walk away from here Lord saying that people will think of us as wise and understanding people who reflect their God because of the way in which we act master and because of the source of our wisdom may that be true for each one of us we ask in the precious name of Jesus Amen <clears throat>